Welcome back to Around the SEC, the last Around the SEC of this year. We'll be back in January, of course, but we're going to take a little bit of a break. Um, but we've got a, we're going to talk a little bit about Shoegate. We're going to hit early signing day a little bit today, and then we're going to go into this weekend's slate of games because even though it's SEC championship week, there is four games, and we'll go over picks at the end. And you have two people in a tie for first place, and you have two people in a tie for last place. And we'll tell you which two when we get there. Guys, how are y'all doing today? Man, I'm great. How about you? Oh, I'm just peachy. How are you doing, Jeff? <laughs> I'm doing pretty well today. Yeah. So, get ready for Christmas. Yeah, our early signing day came and went, and um, we'll get into the, that in a little bit. But um, we're going to start off with Shoegate. And the question that is relevant on everybody's mind is, honestly, who throws a shoe? Yeah, who throws it – who chunks it 20 yards down the field? Why not just, like, spike it if you're going to do anything? What the hell? Oh, I did find it funny that the ref actually announced how far he threw it downfield. That was, oh, that that was had, pretty good. That had me rolling. Yeah. The, the, they, at that point, they just deserve to lose the game. It doesn't matter that it happened on a 57-yard field goal, which, by the way, props to that kid for making that one. But oh, yeah. you just have – just so much. Uh, no, I can't remember. Maybe Elijah Moore last year, but it wasn't it. I mean, that literally did away with their playoff chances, really, realistically, although they only dropped one spot. Yeah, but I think you're right. I mean, looking at it, even if they win the SEC championship this weekend, I don't see how they make it in the playoffs now. So, whereas, you know, they were going in with just one loss, they might. Uh, but no, I, I I saw it when I was watching it. I mean, he didn't he didn't take the shoe off on purpose. It was obviously part of a tackle, but and he just in the heat of the moment chucked it. I I don't know why exactly that's always such a big penalty. Other than maybe it's dangerous to be throwing things like that, especially a cleat. But uh, uh, play of game when you chunk it twenty yards down the field. I mean, I would understand just like tossing it or maybe just like kind of spiking it or you know just kind just, of throwing it up in the air and just letting it fall. But it's just the you, distance he got out of it. Yeah, when you try to launch it down to the other end of the field, you're obviously, obviously trying to get that guy off the field because yep. he has to go get his shoe, and then he has to. So it's a, it's a it's an obvious at the very least it's a delay of game at the at the very 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 least. But I mean, who does that? Yeah, you know, on third and about eight, you make a stop. You're going to get off the field. Your Heisman Trophy candidate is going to get the ball back with about two minutes to go. I mean, all you have to do is say, "Yeah, we're gonna score." Yeah, blank. And, and they, they just desert. It was the ultimate red mist, um, brain fart, whatever you want to call it. it. It was the ultimate version of that. That might have been the most thrown away game I've ever seen in college athletics. Yeah, they turned the ball over three times too. That doesn't help. Uh, you know, obviously, you 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 sh it, obviously it shouldn't come down to. The guy throws a shoe and ruins the game, but it came down to a guy throws a shoe and it ruined the game. But um, yeah, you know they made a ton of mistakes throughout the whole thing. It, they just weren't focused. Florida wasn't. They didn't deserve to win from the start. They sat pits in a cocky decision by uh, Dan Mullen to rest him for the for the uh, SEC championship. And I think Dan Mullen got slapped in the face with the reality that no matter how bad a team is in this league. They can sneak up and get you at any point. Yeah. Yeah, that, that Florida was a team that did not even consider the possibility of losing that game no matter what happened. No, and they paid the all. price. And because, yeah, yeah, and you got the shoe gate, but also there was another freak play in that game where it bounced off a helmet to a guy falling out of bounds and he barely gets a knee in, like two deflections for an interception. I mean, just weird stuff was happening and just – Everything was going against Florida. And then, like you said, they finished it up with a well over a 50-yard kick. It was a it was a strange game, but, yeah, you're right. I think LSU just got lucky in that one with all kinds of just weird things happening. All right, and let's change gears real quick and start to talk a little bit about um, early signing day. Um, I believe – Six teams or seven teams finished in, in the from the SEC finished in the top twenty. 
three of the top four. Georgia had a good day. Tennessee had a good day. Ole Miss had a good day. There were some struggles, as you can imagine, Auburn's struggling, South Carolina's struggling, um, and Vanderbilt is, well, they perennially struggle unless James Franklin is there. But it, overall, it was a pretty good early signing day. And, Corey, give me a couple of players from Georgia's class that you're looking forward to seeing. Well, the obvious two are Brock Vandegrift and Amarius Mims. I think Amarius Mims is, is a day one starter. but So I'm not going to really talk about those guys. Um, two of the people that I'm – some of the positions that I'm really, really excited to see what they can do is the corners – is the corners and the receivers that we signed. Nylon Green from Newton County, Georgia, the cornerback that just committed last week. Uh, he's uh, 6'1", 175 coming in. Uh, I'm excited to kind of see how he does because the defensive backfield is going to be a, uh, an area where there's going to be a lot of uh, – there's going to be a lot of playing time up for grabs. Uh, Adonai Mitchell, who you and I, Steve, broke down when he was formerly committed to Ole Miss. I'm excited to see what he can do. He's a big, tall receiver that can go get it. He's a little bit electric. Um, he's number eight in the state of Tennessee. He's the 54th uh, best receiver. He's still a four, he's still a four star, um, but he's from Cane Ridge. I've seen him uh, up close and personal. The kid's impressive. So um, I think he'll play above his ranking. And then, and then finally, I'm, I'm excited to see kind of what Kamari Lasser can do as a corner. He's in, uh, you're starting to see taller corners getting, getting signed. He's from Tuscaloosa from American Christian Academy. Uh, six foot 185 four star kid uh, excited to see him and uh and excited to see what uh david daniel can do at the safety position from woodstock so the dbs are going to be the intrigue of this class How, what kind of impact can they make early can they make one um and uh, can they you know carry on the tradition of good db play at uh, the university of georgia for the most part what do you got jeb give me a couple of players well, we brought in a couple of, of good defensive players, which you would expect under Jeremy Pruitt to, to really build up that defense. But uh, they both came from – I think they played at St. Francis Academy in Maryland. You got Katron Evans, a defensive tackle, and Aaron Willis, a linebacker. And I was happy with that. I was surprised, though, that they're really – they're really the majority of the defensive players that got brought in today. Uh, Tennessee signed a lot of uh, wide receivers, tight ends, running backs, uh, really building up that offense. The offensive lineman, we've got th at least three of those. Uh, they did sign a four-star dual-threat quarterback uh, who's been committed for a while that everybody's really excited about. Of course, still very excited about Harrison Bailey, too. But now at least uh, there'll be a, a little competition there and maybe some building for the future. Uh, it'll be interesting to see who really gets playing time out of it because I thought some of the true freshman wide receivers we brought in last year were really good, and now we've got some more coming in. Uh, I know it's a Juco running back is one of them that's, that's coming in. Uh, he was the top Juco running back in the nation, and that's uh, – What's his name? Evans, Deion Evans, something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, we lost our good defense, our tight end, the uh, Ole Miss. But we do have a couple of other tight ends coming in. So it's, I think that's it surprised me that it was mostly offense. Although when it's really our defense that we were having so much trouble with this year, but but some good defensive players. So overall, I was happy. This class started to look like it might fall apart there, right before uh, the early signing period. We had at least four people decommit before the day but as the day went along we we got everybody else we were looking for uh no real big surprises i think a, a juco defensive end that we didn't know about came in but other than that uh at least we kept together what we did have so i'm happy okay and steve i know you're excited about hudson wolf right yes big tight end out of tennessee um didn't play his senior year because of a back injury but Hopefully he recovers in time, but he's like 6'7", 240. The two players I'm actually excited about seeing is um, J.J. Henry, the, the super fast slot receiver out of um, Texas, and Tysheen Johnson, the basically honey badger clone out of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Those are two real super athletes that are going to make a lot of plays and are a lot of fun. Of course, Ole Miss also signed Luke Altmeyer, Braylon Brown. Um, they – Brandon Buckhalter and a signing day flip from Mississippi State of MJ Daniels, a 6'3 cornerback, which you were talking about an over six foot cornerback being kind of in vogue at the moment. So, yeah. all in all, um, signing day was a huge success at Ole Miss and nothing but momentum continuing. They also, Friday, it's between them and Florida State for Malik McClain. 
four-star wide receiver. And in February, they're, they are the prohibitive leader for Taiwan Malone. So, he's a defensive yeah, lineman. Corey, Corey Foreman's a, a battle to watch for. I think USC and Georgia are battling for him. Yeah. Any, any, any battles coming up, Jeb? Tennessee's still in? Uh, honestly, I'm not positive. There's still a few good players that I know we're hoping will sign. Uh, a lot of them left for either Alabama or Georgia that we now know are probably not going to sign with us. But yeah. I, and a lot of those are still on defense. I, I, Dylan Brooks, that, yeah, Dylan Brooks is one of them that I know we're still really hoping for out of Alabama. Uh, I'm shocked there's really not many defensive players at all. Like I said, almost nobody in the secondary, which has me a little worried. But uh, I think Deshaun Rucker out of Florida's uh, safety that we're hoping for. But other than that, no, there's just a, a few people left. We'll see how it goes. And I'm, I'm excited uh, going outside of the, the Georgia recruiting class here. I'm excited to see, uh, since we are around the SEC, uh, Texas A&M landed, uh, and I'm going to butcher this name, but uh, two, about the five two star. Mize, yeah, Adelaide, Adelaide uh, defensive end. Uh, five star kid. I'm I'm excited to see kind of what he can bring to that AM defense. Uh AM has a knack for uh getting some pretty good rush ins, I would say. Um, you know, a couple guys you may have heard of, Von Miller and uh Miles Garrett. So um but, A&M is a quarterback away from being a true threat and contender in the West. Yeah, they are. And and they're 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 very, very, very close. And and mm-hmm. so I, I like uh you know, I, I liked what uh, I like what they did with that as far as that goes. Um, LSU getting the number one player in the in the class overall, uh, Mason Smith with two A's, uh, so that was pretty cool. Yeah, he's from home. Um, yep, 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 yep. Uh, then you had a couple other notables. Uh, I'm trying to look at some other some other notables around. Um, Alabama got J.C. Latham, Tommy Brockmeyer, and Dallas Turner. Um, LSU also landed, uh, well, actually LSU got two guys flipped. Jojo Earl, uh, was one of them. Texas a was rumored to have momentum. Alabama also flipped a, a three-star defensive end, Keanu Coat, uh, away from LSU. That was the other guy. Uh, so, uh, if you look at the team rankings as of right now, you have, uh, Alabama at one, LSU at three, Georgia at four, Florida at seven. Tennessee at 14. So you have uh, all those SEC squads there in the top uh, 15 recruiting classes. Florida, uh, most notably, landed, uh, you know, they landed a few good guys in, in this class as well. Uh, Tyreek Sapp, uh, he's their uh, four star 6.0 defensive end. Uh, Carlos Del Rio, uh, as they landed him as a quarterback. Gotta think he's. Uh, related to Jack Del Rio. So uh, an impressive classes around the conference as usual. Uh, not surprised there. So uh, pretty good day for the SEC. Pretty good Steve, day indeed. Go ahead, Jeff. You may know more about this. I'm, I'm curious, just with Mississippi State, Mike Leach, is he getting the quarterback he needs to run his system and, and Sawyer Robertson? I I believe so. He's He is the highest ranked quarterback, I believe, to ever go to Mississippi State. Um, and he's obviously from Lubbock, Texas, so you can imagine the the roots there. So I think he is a Mike Leach style guy. And Luke Altmaier was in Starkville, and Luke Altmaier didn't get a sniff from Mississippi State after Sawyer Robinson committed. Nice. So he, he looks he looks to be the real deal. Although the rest of, the of rest features Ole Miss signed on offense, and then. A quarterback Mississippi State's getting. We might get that a uh, high-powered Mississippi offense going next year. Could be fun. Yeah, it, it could be fun. Also, before we go to the break, um, what are your guys' opinion on the one-time transfer going through committee today? And now it's all you know. Let's go. No more delays. No more waivers needed. One-time transfers are in effect. Just, you know, it, it was just kind of a crapshoot. So. You know, I've always been a proponent of why not just let the kids transfer one time uh, if they're unhappy. That's obviously going to curb the, the free agency period, but um, also it's going to 
prevent, you know, kids from going, okay, I'm not happy at Ole Miss, so I'm going to transfer out. Okay, well, uh, I just signed on at Kansas. Oh, crap, I made a terrible decision. Now i got to sit out because I don't want to be a serial uh, transfer artist. But um, I, I love it. I, I think it's, you know, if it's fair for coaches to jump around and not have any sort of penalty, and you can tell me, um, you know, all sorts of their professionals and getting paid and all that stuff. But, you know, I still think it's kind of messed up that they can transfer so easily uh, from job to job to job. Uh, and kids – uh, normal academic students can transfer from school to school to school uh, with no problems. So why not uh, let the student athletes at least have a shot at that uh, on a one shot deal? I mean, I, I know it's kind of, they, they're signing a contract, but um, you know, give, give them a one shot deal because you know, stuff happens. And so uh, I think it kind of takes away a lot of the excuses and a lot of the, the BS, so to speak. Yeah, and, and yeah. Co- coaches can be honest also that w- them processing players on a year-to-year basis. Now a player can leave just the same, so it's kind of the same way both ways. No, I completely agree. I think I, it's more about – at least it's supposed to be more about education, and I get that. But letting them transfer once isn't going to disrupt their education at all. And when you're coming out of high school, and I, and I, go, I didn't go through this process, so I don't know how it all works. But when you're coming out of high school, the jump to college is a lot different than I think a lot of people realize. You may get to a college and realize you were looking at the wrong things or, or you just weren't assessing the situation because, I don't know, you were, you're, the lights and everything it was just blinding you. And now that you've had a chance to really think about it and see everything, you feel like you'd be a better fit and, and have a better time somewhere else. I have no problem letting them make that transfer once. I don't, I don't see why anybody would be against it. All right. Around the SEC, we need to take a break. When we come back, we'll get into this weekend's action. Um, and we're going to do it a little different just to let you know. But until then, stick around. Only 10% of us get enough daily exercise. And that number is dropping. Nearly 30% of us are overweight or obese. We spend six hours a day in front of a screen. As a result, we now have a shorter life expectancy than our parents. But give us the right start in sports, and we'll never stop. Learn how at activeforlife.ca. Hey, this is Stephen Willis from Positively All Miss. We're almost done with this break. We'll be back with good information quite soon. The military has been in every generation of my family, and so has VA. It wasn't easy for my dad after Vietnam, but VA helped him and my mom get the home they'd always wanted. My grandpa's been coming to VA since World War II. They even helped him lay to rest one of his battle buddies from Normandy. And me, I followed in their footsteps and served with pride. And now that I'm out of the military, the GI Bill is helping me with school. Every generation of my family has served, and VA has served us all. Welcome back to Around the SEC. I, of course, am Stephen Willis, along with Corey Burton and Jeff Beecham. Now we're just going to go along the games. We have four games this weekend. I know it's SEC Champion Week, Championship Weekend. But there is three other games, and we're going to cover those before we get to the championship game. The first one is Ole Miss versus LSU. And I know we talked last week about how LSU was going to be a dumpster fire and everything was going to go wrong, and Florida obviously listened to us and just didn't show up at all. LSU is not that scary. They're not that good. Um, Florida just played one of the worst games I remember seeing. And Ole Miss – is coming off two bye weeks in a row because of COVID where they had to shut down their facility. So you don't really know what you're going to get from them, but it could be an interesting situation to look at moving forward and with Ole Miss being a favorite in Baton Rouge. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, like I said, I I still think LSU is a dumpster fire. Don't get me wrong on that. Um, and Ole Miss is extremely exciting to watch. I think I think LSU will come back down to earth a little bit. 
Uh, I don't think people realize how intense LSU Florida's rivalry is because uh, it's not really a geographical rivalry that people think about, but that's their permanent crossover opponent. And they're not too fond of each other. And, and they've had some freaking knockdown drag out battles over the years. And so um, LSU definitely was up for that game. And, um, you know, Ole Miss, Ole Miss and LSU hate each other. Don't get me wrong, but uh, I don't think LSU can do it two weeks in a row. Um, I still think it's a dumpster fire. Uh, they had a great day today, recruiting wise. Um, but uh, I think that's you know just a, a little drop in the bucket type momentum. I think Ole Miss is going to roll this game, man. Uh, the, Ole Miss just overwhelms people offensively with tempo and things like that. And I think, I think by the time your head stops spinning, Ole Miss has scored twenty one on you, and, and not real sure how how you got there, but. Um, you know, Lane Kiffin just continues to, to figure some things out. I think he's getting the defense settled in a little bit. Uh, they're starting to do some really, really good things over there in Oxford. Um, just hope that Auburn uh, can't come in and, and grab Lane Kiffin. I don't think they can afford him anyway, but um, I, I think Ole Miss has found something special in Lane Kiffin. You know, LSU is a – I mean, they are just, like you say, just a dumpster fire this season, but – they do have just a ton of talent. They, then they've always said that. And then, like I said, with the recruiting class, they're bringing out a bunch more. So it's not a huge surprise, I guess, when they have a good week. It's just everything seems to come together for them, and your uh, their opponent uh, just has a bad week. So LSU can play well. Uh, and it was it was impressive to see the fight they put up this last week. Uh, but I, I kind of agree with you. I think Lane Kiffin will be better prepared for this. He's had a lot of time now to prepare for LSU. Uh, I think he'd like to win his last game, this, his first season here. So uh, I, I think Ole Miss will come out swinging. LSU will score a little bit just because Ole Miss's defense has uh, been having such a tough time this season. But I, I think Ole Miss will pull this one out. Yeah, and and something very possible that you guys might not be aware of. Since the one-time transfer went through yesterday, technically Jacob Springer is eligible to play for Ole Miss Saturday. And he, of course, is an all-conference um, American player from last year from Navy. Free safety. That, that's a that's a uh, breath of fresh air there, huh? Yeah. The, it's, at the beginning of the year, they were counting on Jacob Springer and Otis Reese to kind of be the backbone of their back shell of their defense. And when that wasn't gone, they ended up putting freshmen out there and first-time starters that, that played JUCO, and it, it was just yeah. a mess. Yeah, and you, you knew it was going to be uh... – he knew it was going to be ugly to start the year when, when, when there's so much youth and, and experience. We talked about that in the spring, Steve. But um, too bad, too bad Mississippi State just jumping off topic here. Too bad Mississippi State couldn't couldn't have signed one of the one of the goofiest names in uh, in all the recruiting class, General Booty. <laughs> General where, where did he go? Booty. He's undecided, so he could still land at Mississippi State. Uh, he's from Allen, Texas. Allen High School in Texas. Pro style quarterback, redhead. General better. Booty. Okay, Even so better than Jim Bob Cooter. Yeah. So back to the topic at hand. Um, so yeah, I think yeah, I, I and Otis Otis Reese has got to be thinking when he saw this rule pass with the transfer rule, he's gotta be thinking, come on, man. Really? They couldn't pass that weeks ago and help me out. Yeah, because he had some he had some struggles getting uh, getting cleared. Yeah, and um, he's probably the only player in Ole Miss history that made their debut in the Egg Bowl. Yeah, no doubt. But he had a great game and was definitely a difference maker. Yep. Oh yeah, totally. All right, all right let's move on to Knoxville, Texas A and M versus Tennessee. Texas A and M favored by fourteen points against Tennessee, who is. They're going to go with youth. They're going to try and force old man football down Texas A&M's throat, who's going to try to do the same thing against Tennessee. It could be 17-14. It could be 42 to nothing. Um, either way, I think it's going to be an A&M type game. Uh, yeah. You imagine the look on a and faces when Tennessee be- – sorry. I almost got all that out. <laughs> it's uh, – no, I, I – you know, I love Tennessee, and, and I, I'm glad they're finally playing Harrison Bailey. Actually, JT's looked really good, too. So, I'm I'm looking forward to the game, but A&M's defense is really good, and I just – I don't – I don't see Tennessee scoring a whole lot in that one. It's, it's going to be a, a growing game for Harrison Bailey, basically just us uh, 
working on next year. It's one of those games where Harrison Bailey could grow up quite a bit if he goes into it with the right mindset. A&M plays a funky matchup zone that quarterbacks don't usually see. And it's something that if he could get that and play relatively well, it's really going to bode well for his development down the road. Yeah, I kind of I kind of like what, you know, I, I hate that it was too little too late with him uh, because I think he could have gotten a lot of his growing pains out already. Um, so, and I think I, I think they should have went to him sooner when they realized that we're not going to get much out of JG. And, you know, if, if we're going to lose, we might as well lose with a freshman. Um, and I, it just it just doing Harrison Bailey a little bit of a disservice by not uh, starting with him sooner, trying to develop him sooner, and even get him reps in practice even. But that's neither here nor there. That's water under the bridge. That's old news, whatever. Um, I think this is a great matchup for Harrison Bailey. I mean, he, he had a great one against Florida uh, that kind of baptized him a little bit, gave him some really good experience uh, to, you know, to kind of see what an upper echelon uh, SEC opponent was going to look like. So I, I think, you know, this is going to be a pivotal off season for him. And I think this will be uh, the last big step for him to carry on into the off season and say, okay, yes, they, they play a funky coverage. So, all right, I can really watch. I can really watch myself on film and and be ready for for this type of thing uh, when next season rolls around. So I, I think he's going to have a lot of good film work to work on. Um, I wish he had more, but he's going to have a lot of stuff to develop. And and uh, you know, I, I like the direction that this kid's going. Um, it doesn't seem like he's going in the right direction, but I think he is. You know, if you if you really dive down deep, I, th- I think he is. I agree with you. I'd I'd love to see Tennessee get aggressive in this game on offense, uh, using Eric Gray and Ty Chandler and and some of that speed they have at the young wide receiver position and and really attack A and M just to see how it goes. I don't think it's going to happen. I I think we're going to stay pretty conservative throughout the game and lose it pretty handily. But I would love to see it. At least try, see what you've got in him, see what he can do, and give him some experience. Jeremy Pruitt basically wasting this year of Eric Gray running this old man football offense is practically criminal. It's a shame that people just don't get to see what is potentially the one of the best running backs in the SEC. I have to agree. Yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you. Crazy. All right, let's move on to Missouri at Mississippi State. Missouri is a one-point favorite against the Dogs down in Starkville. Missouri, um, under Barry Odom, they'd be very familiar with the drop eight coverage that everybody runs against Mike Leach now. This could be a bad matchup for Mississippi State, but who knows if they take a step with Will Rogers. Yeah, I, I think I think they do. I mean, I think that this is a very interesting matchup because you got two freshman quarterbacks, Basilick and, and Will Rogers, that are both on an upward uh, trajectory. Um, you know, it, it's hard to kind of judge Basilick last week against Georgia. Georgia had a resurgence in defense finally. Uh, I think they communicated finally <laughs> in the secondary. I think they got guys lined up right, and they played and they played hard and and they made plays and, and they flew around and they played that Georgia defense that we saw against Auburn and Tennessee. So, um, and, and then the second half against Arkansas or really the whole game against Arkansas. So um, just throw that game out there. But I, I think both these quarterbacks are on a great upward trajectory. I, I really like what they both do on offense. Uh, Larry Roundtree is one of my favorite running backs to watch um, in, in this conference. He's uh, too bad he's leaving. I think he's a senior, right? Yeah, but he doesn't have to leave. He doesn't want to. That is true, but I, I think uh, the NFL is uh, it's going to be a good fit for him. So, um, yeah, I, I, I uh, in, in my picks, I don't want to spoil it. Um, I, I pick I pick a school that starts with an M uh, to win this game. But you know, I, I think it's going to be interesting to kind of see how Mississippi State's going to end the season. Are they going to end on a high note? Uh, win or lose, are they going to end on a high note? Are you know you're you're going to really kind of see now what they have, what they will have, and, and kind of where their focus is uh, goal-wise to work on in the offseason. And I think just general team cohesion what was a uh, what was an obvious goal here, and just kind of building that culture 
um, in year one under Mike Leach. And that's always a, a staple of a Mike Leach program. Year one's always going to be, let's rip it down to, let's rip it down to the, to the barest point and, and build it back up. So this will be a fun game to watch. I think this will be one of the, obviously, I, I think this will be a better game matchup wise than, uh, than the SEC championship. Yeah, I think uh, Coach Eli there in Missouri, his, uh, his candidacy for uh, SEC Coach of the Year took a little bit of a hit last week with Georgia, but I think it's still on track. They've they've definitely been the surprise. I mean, obviously Nick Saban probably should win it, but he probably should win it every year, and he wants that. So uh, I, he did so much there at, at Missouri uh, with with what he had. It's been impressive. I could see Missouri running away with this game. But Mississippi State, you just never know. when If Mike Leach can get that offense going with Will Rogers, and they've really gotten better about it the last two or three weeks. Uh, who knows? He may actually, if, if Missouri's not prepared for it, they may run right over him. So, so you're right. It's a great matchup just because I have no idea what's going to happen. Can't wait to see it. All right. Around the SEC, going into a break. When we come back, Alabama and Florida, the SEC championship, he gets a segment by itself. Stick around. Only 10% of us get enough daily exercise. And that number is dropping. Nearly 30% of us are overweight or obese. We spend six hours a day in front of a screen. As a result, we now have a shorter life expectancy than our parents. But give us the right start in sports, and we'll never stop. Learn how at activeforlife.ca. Hey, this is Stephen Willis from Positively Ole Miss. We're almost done with this break. We'll be back with good information quite soon. The military has been in every generation of my family and so has VA. It wasn't easy for my dad after Vietnam, but VA helped him and my mom get the home they'd always wanted. My grandpa's been coming to VA since World War II. They even helped him lay to rest one of his battle buddies from Normandy. And me, I followed in their footsteps and served with pride. And now that I'm out of the military, the GI Bill's helping me with school. Every generation of my family has served, and VA has served us all. Welcome back around the SEC. We're here for SEC Championship Saturday, Alabama versus Florida in Atlanta. We made it through a season. We did everything we we're supposed to do. This was a rough year, but we got here, and now Alabama gets to curve stomp the Gators. Yes, <laughs> it's. Uh, I can't. I can't think of a. Uh, I can't think of a more lopsided uh, fair here, um, with uh, with an SEC championship. I mean, Florida comes in, and you know they just come in on like limping in on on two wheels. You, know, you got two flat. You know, they, they were come. They were roaring in uh, previously, but they found a, a bed of nails on the road right before they got to Atlanta, and, and now they're just kind of limping in. And Alabama is – I never thought I'd say this, but it almost seems like they're more explosive without Jalen Waddell. Uh, and that's odd to say. But uh, Devontae Smith has kind of just taken on the role of, of both of them combined and taken on the, the special teams challenge and things like that. And it's just – it's going to be ugly, man, honestly. It's going to be ugly. I think Devontae Smith's going to have three touchdowns himself. Najee Harris – it, it, he's he's a load to stop in the run game. I mean, it's just – it's pick your poison, man, with the, with this group. Yeah, if I'm Florida and I'm trying to look for what I want to do, I mean, Alabama has given up some big uh, passing games to a few teams, including Ole Miss. So, and Florida is great at passing the ball. You know, got the Kyles out there uh, and Toomey and some of the others. And, and so, I, I think Florida can score some points in this game. But they're also not great at stopping the run. So Alabama, you know, will just run Najee Harris right down their throat. And then nobody's going to stop Devontae Smith. So they're going to be able to throw. It's just, unfortunately, I don't know anybody right now that can slow down Alabama's offense enough to be able to win a game against them. And Florida is definitely not at the top of that list. 
Yeah, and you know, this game reminds me of the mid-90s, late-90s matchup where Arkansas or Mississippi State or so-and-so would go to Atlanta and just get drilled by Tennessee or Florida. I mean, it's just like the inverse of that game. Mm -hmm. yeah. It is. It really is. Because it used to be the East would, would, was dominant. Now the West is dominant. And, and it's just, yeah, it, it's bad. This is, it's it's going to be ugly. I hate yeah. to say it. And that's really all I can really say about it. I mean, Florida, Florida for all the firepower they have offensively, I, I don't – defensively, they're, I mean, they're going to have to keep up. It, it's going to be a track meet. And right now, honestly, Alabama's Usain Bolt. Um, and Florida can score. But I don't think they can score as early, often, and frequently, as quickly as Alabama can. You know, they got Kyle Pitts. They got Kadarius Toney, things like that. But Alabama can really break you back. And, and that's, that, that worries me for the Gators. Um, and that worries me for everyone that's getting their hopes up that this is going to be like game of the century. It ain't going to be game of the century. Uh, and because I said that, it's going to be four overtimes and uh, Florida's going to win. But, um, you know, in, in all honesty, it's just – let's be realistic about this thing. Alabama is a freaking buzzsaw. Alabama is the best team in the country. They're the best team in America. Been saying that for a little while now. Um, Clemson's pretty damn good. Not better than Bama. Notre Dame's pretty damn good. Not better than Bama. Ohio State – not, not a big enough sample size to really know if they can compete with Bama, but I doubt it. Uh, Texas A&M, already lost to them. Probably will probably lose to them again. Probably get beat worse uh, second time around. So you, you got to look at it as you just got to tip your cap to Nick Saban and say, my God, dude, you built the squad. Yeah, and and that, That's the reality. Yeah, and you take a team like Alabama who – Steve Sarkeesian is just a master of getting matchups in the pass game, going up mm -hmm. against third and Grantham. It yes. It could be a scary situation. Oh, God, third and Grantham. Jeez Louise. Yeah, I think, I think you're going to see a lot of Dan Mullen chewing out Todd Grantham on the sideline. Yeah, probably not in the second half. <laughs> <laughs> might get, might get a little bit numb in the second half. But I do I <laughs> probably I, I do look for um Najee Harris and Brian Robinson um to have a larger role in the game because honest to God, Alabama had or Florida has two choices um to stop to try and contain this Alabama offense, and that is either drop everybody back in coverage, which they're gonna kill you in the running game or blitz yeah. everybody, which there's nobody that can one-on-one -on -one cover Devontae Smith. So, yeah, I, I just don't know. And it's going to be a game. Also, look at look for a, maybe a touchdown by Miller Forrestal, just completely left all along. Yeah, that's, that's, another, that's another one. You're just like, oh, you got Mechie, you got Forrestal, you got the two running backs. I mean – I mean, pick your poison. Oh, who's the guy from Monroe, Louisiana, like um, that replaced um, Jalen Waddle on the slot? That's Mechie, I think, right? No, it's like Slade something. Boulder, Bolden. It's like Bolden. Yeah. It's probably some really cool Cajun name that we're not thinking about. No, he's from up around Monroe, so he's, he's pretty close to Mississippi at that point. We're, we're, <laughs> They're pretty much the same um, DNA. No, we're not down in Cajun land yet. Uh, okay. Yeah, just running through Alabama's roster trying to figure out what, what Florida can do because, like I said, Florida may be able to score some points, and their only hope is a shootout that they can win. And you're thinking, well, they need somebody on Alabama's side to mess up, but Mac Jones doesn't throw interceptions. Najee Harris doesn't lose the ball. The Devontae Smith, you know, Mechie, all, none of these people drop the ball. It's just no. – I mean, it, yeah, I, I just don't understand what anybody does right now to stop Alabama. Yeah, and they're going to bracket um, Kyle Pitts because that is going to be the weapon of choice for Florida. So the outside guys might be single coverage. You have a chance at maybe hitting some back shoulder, which Bama's proven that they're susceptible for, even as well-drilled yeah. as they are. 
Yeah, I, th- I think if Florida's going to have a big game, uh, I think Jermaine Copeland's going to have to going to have to have himself a day because he's going to have a lot of one on one matchups and a lot of holes to, to to run in and a lot of a lot of open grass uh, because they just can't simply account for everybody. So, um, yeah, I think that uh, I think that he'll have a chance to to really get some shine in this game. And I think they're going to at least a little bit. Um, try and use a similar game plan that they used against Georgia, putting their backs on the linebackers, maybe putting Kyle Pitts in the backfield and sending him out, um, or especially early on to mess with the coverage scheme. I, I, I think may- I think other people know how to ru- know how to defend wheel routes, um, so it shouldn't be too big of an issue. Um, you know, if Bama can figure out, I think they can figure out a wheel route. Yeah, and Nick Saban can do combo coverage. He's been doing combo coverages in the SEC since probably before everybody else. I so mean, co- cover seven's his thing, right? Yeah. Which is, it's like a match quarters, I think, is what it is. Uh, it's like a pattern match quarters. And they're so good with communication. Oh, my God, yeah. they're. I mean, the bust are like – when I say few and far between, I mean like there might there might have been like two or three coverage busts all year, and I think all three of them were in the Ole Miss game. And it, and that was tempo caused. Uh, yeah, if you, if it, you it was caused by tempo, yeah. and it was caused by the fact that normally in training camp is when you work out a lot of these kinks. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where tempo's been a huge uh, a huge deal is because. Teams can practice against it in training camp and spring, and you know they can get ready for it for a little bit. But I think not having that normal schedule kind of messed it up there, and I and I think it messed up the conditioning too, uh, because teams aren't aren't as in shape now, and that 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 doesn't help either. And going forward, also, this is not to change the subject. Teams aren't going to be as, as in as good a shape as they have been because you have to play your freshman or the freshman is going to use their one-time transfer. Yeah. It, yeah. That, I mean, that's going to become more, more vital. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And, you know, you're just going to see, you know, it's going to change the way you recruit because you're, you know, you're going to have to recruit the transfer portal about just as hard as you recruit the – the the outgoing high schoolers and so you know i think georgia's going to get a big um transfer portal victory with eric gilbert so um i'm excited about that yeah and and most coaches um even jeremy pruitt down the lane even over in kirby they basically converted their recruiting offices into basically a modern player personnel facility to where you're not just recruiting high schoolers you're recruiting all different types yeah, you're, you're gonna see you're gonna see colleges now uh, set up like, like it's the uh, like they're in the NFL where you have uh, college scouting and pro scouting. You know, you're gonna have the equivalents of that. You're gonna have you're gonna have a few guys dedicated to the transfer portal, and you're gonna have a few guys, and you're gonna have the rest dedicated to high school scouting and stuff like that. So uh, it's gonna be interesting to kind of see how it all shakes out and how all the off the field positions shake out. How much is added to to account for? Uh, really scouring the the transfer the transfer window. So, yeah, and it, and this probably will not be the best game in the world. But enjoy the SEC championship game. It's kind of the ceremonial end of the regular season as we go into the bowl season. But we're going to take a short break. We're going to come back, and we've got a little picks time. Picks, picks, picks. Only 10% of us get enough daily exercise. And that number is dropping. Nearly 30% of us are overweight or obese. We spend six hours a day in front of a screen. As a result, We now have a shorter life expectancy than our parents. But give us the right start in sports, and we'll never stop. Learn how at activeforlife.ca. 
Hey, this is Stephen Willis from Positively Ole Miss. We're almost done with this break. We'll be back with good information quite soon. The military has been in every generation of my family, and so has VA. It wasn't easy for my dad after Vietnam, but VA helped him and my mom get the home they'd always wanted. My grandpa's been coming to VA since World War II. They even helped him lay to rest one of his battle buddies from Normandy. And me? I followed in their footsteps and served with pride. And now that I'm out of the military, the GI Bill's helping me with school. Every generation of my family has served, and VA has served us all. Welcome back to Around the SEC. Hey, Stephen Willis along with Corey and Jeb. It is picks time. There's only four games this week, so we can kind of go over it. Um, I went three and two last week. Jeb and Corey went four and one. Becky went three and two. That leaves us with an overall record of me and Jeb are tied at 31 and 24. And Becky and Corey um, is coming in at 28 and 27. So technically, they could catch us but it's not likely. <laughs> yeah, I'm little, going. I'm going on a four zero streak, but it doesn't look like I'm gonna. Doesn't look like I'm gonna make up much ground because. Yeah, you I, picked the I, same teams I did. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, I'm above five hundred. I'm cool. Yeah, and I changed. Uh, I changed one on purpose, but we'll talk about it. Okay, um, Ole Miss getting two and a half points on the road at LSU. Honestly, if I stopped and told you in June that Ole Miss is going to play LSU in Baton Rouge this year and be favored by two and a half points, you would have told me I was high. Yes. Um, but I'm, I'm going with Ole Miss in this game to cover. I think it's just in a position to where, I mean, they just will. They have a better team. I can't believe I'm saying that, but they do. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, as good as LSU played – um, against Florida, and I think they've, you know, this is a different discussion for a different day, but I think they potentially found their quarterback in uh, Max Johnson. Indeed. They just don't have enough firepower. I, 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 like the, I like the ribs. Yeah, I think LSU's got a lot of talent, but they're just running in circles right now. It all came together last week. It's great. I don't think they can do it twice in a row, though, so I'm, I'm going with Ole Miss as well. And Becky is going with Ole Miss as well. Texas A&M giving away 14 points, minus 14 at Rocky Top, Tennessee. Um, I'm going with Texas A&M, just lay, um, going to lay the points. Let's see how it shakes out. I just think they're going to be better at playing old man football than Tennessee. Well, this is where I differed, and I only did this because I don't want to stand in a tie. So I, I decided if I'm going to go for a win at – at all of this, I'm going to go with my team and do it. So I'm taking Tennessee to cover that spread, to come out and have a much better game than any of us expected to see from them, or A&M to stumble either way. And I not only get to see Tennessee play well, maybe even come close to winning, maybe win, but I'll also win in our picks. So I'm going with Tennessee. Jeff, I, I think I think if you wanted to win in your picks, you should have went different on, on the next <laughs> game. But um, I, I think A&M – even if they sleepwalk to start the first half, I see this game kind of going like the Georgia-Missouri game went last week where Tennessee's going to fight them, fight them hard, and you're going to be like, in the first half, you're going to be like, whoa, okay, all right, I see Tennessee. And then Tennessee's going to run out of gas, and a and M's going to put the pedal down to the metal, and they're going to pull away. Uh, they did it against Arkansas. That's kind of been their MO. Uh, you know, they, they just have that extra gear in the second half that they seem to kind of – put their game into and, and I think they're going to do it uh, and I think they're going to cover so give me the Aggies Becky is taking Tennessee as well I do think Isaiah Spiller is going to have a big game especially in the fourth quarter um, Mizzou at minus one versus Mississippi State down in Starkville um, I'm going with the Missouri Tigers um, I like Connor Basilak I like Larry Roundtree I like that offensive squad going against that defense and Missouri had a rough game last week, but I think they come back in this one too and, and really take out Mississippi State. And I agree, I could have gone with Mississippi, Mississippi State in this one or LSU and probably would have been smarter. I just, I just wanted to go with my team. But, but in this one, you. yeah, I think Missouri. I don't blame you. Um, I, I just think Missouri is more put together uh, than, than Mississippi State. Mississippi State's really not far away, not as far away as, we, as they once were or they were once thought to be uh, in the beginning of the season. I think they've come miles and miles and miles. They've still got miles to go. 
um, which is why I like Missouri in this game. Uh, but I think MSU is going to surprise some folks and, and play really well. Yes, and Becky um, picked Mississippi State in this game, which I'll talk to her about later. Um, Alabama in the SEC championship game, favored by 17 points over Florida. You know what? I'm going to pick Alabama, and there's probably uh, maybe 28 points before I'd consider not picking Alabama in this game. Uh I hope Florida puts up a better fight than that just for us. We see a better game. But as we've said all season, you just can't pick against Alabama if you want to win in these picks. So I have to exactly. go with Bama. And until Bama doesn't cover one of these giant spreads, I, I'm, I'm, I'm rolling with the tide. And I hope they double the spread on Florida personally. Um, so. Shocking. So maybe I should pick Florida if I want that to happen. <laughs> Well, Becky did. Becky picked Florida in the game because basically she knows she needed to make up a bunch of games on me. So she's trying to catch me. So that that that's that's her game plan to make up three games is to go four and zero, oh and I go one and three because she's not going to pick against Ole Miss. Um, but that is around the SEC for Corey and Jeb. I'm Steve. Um, Hope you enjoyed it. Just as a reminder, um, this is our last show of the year. We'll be back probably the first or second week of January with new intro music. It's going to sound great, I think, and um, I can't wait for you to hear it. So until then, for them, I'll see you then. Bye-bye.